Welcome to Mail Times, Suresh Venkat. Last month, advertising agency Ogilvy UK's Behavioural Science Division released the 10th edition of the Behavioural Science Annual. Filled with case studies, social initiatives and behavioural interventions from Ogilvy teams across the world, the annual helps understand the role of behavioural science in the advertising process. To know more, I was in conversation with Rory Sutherland, Vice Chairman Ogilvy UK, and Ella Jenkins, consultant with the agency's behavioral science practice at Ogilvy. How does behavioral science help advertising? Let's find out as we get ready to melt with Rory Sutherland and Ella Jenkins. Rory Sutherland and Ella Jenkins, welcome to Melt. Rory, first question for you. When and how did agencies lose this problem-solving game to big consulting? Interesting question. I mean, I'd also argue, by the way, that big consulting has slightly lost the plot. It slightly turned its attention away from strategy consulting, which was its original remit, towards kind of huge technological implementation projects. And it's also become increasingly specialised along uh, business silos. And it's done that in order to expand and in order to effectively increase the number of hours worked, not necessarily increasing its value in the process. I always think that payment by the hour is actually a very perverse incentive. I think the reason agencies lost it a little bit was that they missed an opportunity when they shifted from payment by commission, when you are obviously incentivized to solve every problem with a bought media solution. And rather sadly, I think, when they move to payment by the hour, which I don't think is perfect, but at least frees you up to solve problems that don't necessarily involve bought media as part of the solution, um, I think they slightly lost an opportunity because the muscle memory of effectively delivering communication solutions and bought media solutions, that muscle memory was so strong, they never really created new habits and recognised the opportunity, which is now actually the potential playing field for creative solutions and human insights, is now 10 times larger than it was before. And I think they missed that opportunity and failed to capture that ground, to be honest. It's easy to say that with hindsight, of course. True. Uh, you know, it's that. easy to see see that with the wisdom of twenty years of hindsight. But nonetheless, I think um, there's also there are also wider philosophical problems. For example, I think the shareholder value movement has been disastrous, mm -hmm. in that it means that most businesses look at business through the lens of effectively aggregated revenue, and they tend to approach problems with an efficiency mindset. Uh, rather than a value creation mindset. Mm -hmm. They tend to create problems as though value was created at head office, whereas, of course, as we all know, value is actually created on the shelf and in the marketplace. And I think, um, I think what we've ended up with, if you want it in a sentence, we've ended up with a culture of business consulting, which is too much tailor and not enough drucker. That would be my one sentence kind of diagnosis of the problem. On that note, let me move to Ella. Ella, in your annual report, Rory compares behavioral science consulting to comedy, of all things, uh, in the sense that it's obvious once it's pointed out. Here's the problem, though. Clients don't like paying for the obvious. How do you sell the idea of this sort of obvious consulting to clients? So everything we do in our practice is grounded in data and evidence. So whether that's creating bespoke research for our clients or just tapping into knowledge that already exists elsewhere. So this means that all of our interventions have been informed by something that's been previously tested and has existed in another category. So something that makes a real big difference when we sell to clients is using what we call lateral category examples. Now, these are examples of where a similar behavioral problem might have been solved elsewhere in another category. So by showing evidence of where something has worked before in a kind of unrelated field, it can help to back up our ideas um, and explain that why the idea is likely to work. But as you say, like sometimes it does take a bit of persuading to get clients to even just warm to behavioral science as a concept and as a field, um, because we do look at and interpret problems in quite a different way. So in that instance, I'd say we try to start quite small. We start to, we try to pilot our interventions, test and learn and show that they work, um, and then try and also get senior client buy-in where possible, because that is always, always an effective way to motivate the rest of the, the agency. 
Rory, what explains the enduring uh, agency obsession with media budgets? Isn't it obvious to everybody? I mean, since the days of Edward Bernays in the 1950s, behavioral scientists and at that time PR people were using behavioral science to sell products and services and increase value. Why this obsession with media budgets? That's a good question. Part of it was driven by the fact that there was a brief period of a couple of decades, particularly after the advent of television, where media commission could be for an agency insanely lucrative mm -hmm. and therefore provided you were selling a big television solution, you didn't really have to worry about everything else. You can remember the phrase, of course, uh, above the line and below the line, which I haven't heard much in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. but above the line and below the line as a distinction uh, was an absolutely recurring phrase in the first sort of 15 to 20 years of my working life. I started in 1988. And above the line referred to activities on which there was commission. And below the line, which included things like direct marketing, sales promotion and so forth, and PR. Um, and what was so strange was that the distinction was made not according to what the value was of the function or what it was for, but concerning how you were paid for it. And I think those those incentives can have very long hangover effects mm -hmm. where they, you know, over a period of decades, they effectively shape the whole way the business is constructed and the way people work and indeed the way people think. I mean, there is an all, another problem, I think, which is, um, you know, measures like ROI tend to encourage people to spend a million dollars and get, if you like, 1.4 million back. Now, sometimes in, in behavioral science, uh, you can actually literally, and we've done it, by the way, you spend £25,000 and you get an incremental £12 million of extra revenue every single year as the result of a one-off intervention of £25,000. Now, what's interesting about that, actually, is that uh, in a weird kind of way, People aren't looking. You can actually have a solution which is too cheap because the, the ROI, ROI idea, in many ways, people with a $2 million budget don't want to spend $40,000. And you can actually be too small to gain attention because it's assumed, you know, the senior person who's a budget holder believes that these things are kind of almost beneath their dignity or that they can't be important because they're so small. So there is a weird thing, I think, where you can actually be a victim of your own effectiveness. The other problem, of course, is that no one has a budget for solving a problem they didn't know they had. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things that's difficult for us, I know this because I worked in direct marketing. It was always the same in direct marketing. You had to persuade a client to do direct marketing before you could sell them a specific service. Advertising, broadly speaking, you know, many, many players have existing large advertising budgets. And therefore, uh, you know, it's a given that they're going to be spending some money on advertising. It's just a question of how. Now, one of the things I think this has done is it's focused too much attention, perhaps uh, too much creative attention. Well, one, I would say there's probably too much creative attention paid to consumer marketing relative to trade marketing. Um, and there's probably too little um, attention paid to things like B2B. Now, things like B2B or, for example, tech startups, they will never have large media budgets. But the potential for using creative insight to create value uh, with those entities may be actually, you know, an order of magnitude greater than it is with the conventional packaged goods clients. Ella, let me ask a follow up to uh, Rory's statement. How is B2B consulting different from B2C consulting from your perspective? It's an interesting question, and I think it depends on a couple of things. The first being what the actual behavioural problem is. So what are you trying to understand? And knowing that as humans, we all behave in the same same way in, in general. Um, so trying to get to the crux of the matter can actually mean that sometimes it's quite a similar challenge. and You can use similar approaches and create similar kind of creative ideas. But on the other hand, when trying to understand the audience, that's almost the first step in any behavioural brief. And when the audience is, is different with the B2C and the B2B, you have to understand what motivates and drives these different people in the different contexts. So I think in some ways it can be really similar, but in some ways you can get to completely different solutions. Ella's nailed that. And actually B2B has always suffered from 
two opposite and wrong-headed beliefs. One mm -hmm. of which is that when people put on a suit and sit behind a desk, they immediately become economic man, completely rational, and therefore there is no scope for kind of psychological solutions. All you can do is make your product cheaper or better, nothing else to be done, nothing to see here, move on. Or you get the similarly wrong-headed thing, which is people are just people, it's all absolutely the same. And that's not quite true. There are obviously, it rhymes, you know, there are similarities, there are recurring findings, as Ella has said. But I always make the point that as a consumer, you probably don't have to justify your decision to anybody except yourself and perhaps your spouse. I've often jokingly said that when consumers make a decision, they're trying to minimise the risk of regret. And when business people, or for that matter, politicians make a decision, they're trying to minimise the risk of blame. And uh, there's a kind of, there are undoubtedly patterns in B2B, what you might call no one ever got fired for buying IBM. There are mm -hmm. patterns of behaviour in B2B, risk averse behaviour, loss averse behaviour, uh, which are heavily, I think, amplified in B2B compared to, to B2C. Ultimately, you can justify a B2C decision in many cases by saying, I like it. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. now, you can't go to your board of directors and say, I've chosen this supplier because, hey, they're just a bunch of really nice guys. <laughs> okay, it's not quite the same in that respect. Rory, Indian clients and perhaps clients everywhere in the world like paying for tangible things like a big commercial, a Super Bowl commercial with athletes and movie stars. Now, the kind of work you do at Ogilvy Consulting could be a behavioral nudge. It can be quite a subtle intervention. It's not a large, flashy commercial. How do you deal with what clients want versus what they actually may need? Uh, it's interesting that because in some ways, you know, very good nudge solutions are sometimes invisible. It's a very fair point that actually it's something, by the way, advertising suffers from because it is much, much easier uh, to get approval to spend money on investing in plant, for example, um, or some particular tangible asset versus investing in consumer psychology, consumer behavioral change. And also, of course, marketing in general has always suffered from the fact that, you know, there is a high degree of uncertainty involved. And it also suffers from the fact that a lot of the value it creates can't be perfectly quantified. And I think I think quite a lot of digital marketing is trying to solve that problem by saying, don't worry, it used to be that half the money you spend on advertising was wasted, but you didn't know what which half. Now, with digital advertising, you don't need to worry because you can perfectly quantify it and eliminate waste and achieve this kind of, uh, you know, uh, extraordinary efficiency, which is possibly true, but only if you're prepared to massively limit the effectiveness of your marketing. And in marketing, there is a trade-off between efficiency and effectiveness. One of the problems of quantification, and I, I learned this working in direct marketing. Direct marketing is great because you can test, you can measure, you can quantify. But the downside is, is that once people get hooked on quantification, you're no longer allowed to do anything that you can't quantify. Now, a lot of marketing and brand building has long-term effects. When you have a long-term effect, by its very nature, one, the results are going to be slow to appear, and that may be too slow for the career path of the person who's funding it. Look, I need to prove effectiveness in quarter three. I can't go around saying this is going to be great in two years' time. But also, of course, when the effects are further down the line chronologically, attribution, single attribution becomes more and more difficult because far more other stimuli have appeared and far more other events and contextual factors have appeared to muddy the waters in the, in the meantime. And so this focus on efficiency is distorting um, marketing spend uh, towards short-term effects and away from longer-term brand building. Now, actually, some of that correction was probably necessary and healthy. But I think it's inarguable, and I think the IPA in London has data to show this, it's inarguable to say that this has now gone too far, that people are incapable of doing anything that doesn't have an immediate effect, which means that effectively you're incapable of doing two-thirds of the things that marketing can potentially do. Rory, there's quite a strident criticism of so-called performance marketing, hmm. and a whole host of companies, digital startups, new age companies, old economy companies. Not, 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 a criticism. Not, not, not a criticism. Um, uh, and Mark Ritson puts this very well. It's both and. 
This is actually a, an interesting factor in behavioral science, which is we have a slight, um, a slight over propensity towards binary thinking. You know, this is better than this, so we should do all of this and none of that. You know, so you know, it's a very, very common response to data. I mean, I, funnily enough, I've just been having exactly the same argument about flexible working versus face-to-face -face meetings, and you get a little bit of evidence in that says that in this respect. Face-to-face -face meetings are better than flexible working. And people say, yes, I told you all along, flexible working is stupid, we shouldn't be doing it. And I said, this is much closer. This is not a science where you say X is right, Y is wrong, therefore we do X. This is a science a bit like crop rotation. And I would argue that the mentality we need to investigate things like face-to-face -face meetings versus Zoom and remote meeting I mean, it's worth noting, by the way, that this meeting would be better if we were all in the same room. But on the other hand, it would have cost $10,000 in travel costs and it would have taken eight months to organise. So as a result, it probably wouldn't have happened at all or it would have happened 10 months later. And there's a value to being able to meet really, really quickly at no cost. OK, so I think what we need, when we look at things like flexible working versus face to face meetings or when we look at performance marketing versus brand building marketing, what we want is not that Prussian forestry mentality, which is the most efficient tree is the Norwegian spruce. So we will only plant Norwegian spruce, which caused one brilliant year, you know, one brilliant season of, of forestry before parasites took over and you ended up with forest death. What you want is something a bit like the British agricultural revolution of the 18th century, where they experimented with combinations of crops operating in series and actually gain something like a twofold, um, two or threefold increase in uh, agricultural productivity, which meant that actually it effectively meant that, um, uh, you know, you, the population of the UK could grow by two or three times without resulting starvation. And I think it's a mentality of both and and complementarity, not a mentality of better, worse, therefore kill off kill off one one half of what we do and and humans as in brains tend always to gravitate towards that kind of binary decision making in your annual report you have one indian case study that saddle on chopsticks where you embedded soap into chopsticks so that children who use chalk to write in schools could wash their hands immediately afterwards so ella how do you measure outcomes in a case like this and I, let me quantify that question children falling ill is easy to measure or relatively easy to measure but children staying healthy is the normal state of affairs. So how do you measure outcomes in a case like that, in the Savlon case? So it is tricky. For Savlon <clears throat> specifically, the chalk sticks were first prototyped and then launched in a large scale trial. So initially they went out to 100 schools and then because the demand grew so much, they were actually ended up being distributed to over 150,000 children. And I think that was 50,000 individual boxes of chalk sticks. So in this case study, the fact that the soap was being used and the demand was increasing suggests that it was having a positive impact on hand washing behaviours because the children were using the chalk sticks and then washing their hands and then needing more. So that kind of suggests that it was an, an improvement. In other situations, we'll do things like user, te user testing and randomised control trials. So for example, we worked with a blood cancer charity called DKMS in the UK where we behaviourally optimised their, uh, something called their Lifesaver pack, and it was their communications pack that they send out to donors before they donate their stem cells. So after we optimised this pack, we conducted um, a rigorous study which looked at participants' comprehension, motivation, and their brand perception. Um, and by doing that survey and that study, we were able to kind of track the increases in these, in these measures. Um, so there's a different range of, sort of spectrum of things you can do to test the outcomes and test the effectiveness. Sometimes actually you do have to use a proxy. So if you're running a social media campaign which is designed to improve awareness, like we did with our um, food waste challenges with uh, RAP, who's an organisation in the UK, sometimes you have to look at engagement figures on the social media posts. So you have to look at the likes and shares and use that almost as an indication for knowledge increasing and awareness raising. But I do think that in behavioural science, it is really difficult to actually check outcomes and make sure that X leads to Y. As Rory mentioned earlier, 
often you have to infer things and assume that it's it's almost leading to a triggering a lot of different impacts at the same time. All right, I have one final question for both of you. I'll start with Rory. Rory, what happens if one of your campaign backfires and and for instance a campaign that's aimed at lowering drinking, lowering drinking and driving actually increases drinking and driving? What do you do then? Well, funnily enough, there's a name for this which originates in India because it's called the Cobra Effect. And it arose, um, I think, under the Raj when the British, terrified by the growth of cobras in around Delhi, started paying incentives for people who brought in dead snakes. And s- people started snake farming effectively. I think what then happened is when they realised this was happening, that people were actually farming snakes in order to sell them. Uh, When you remove the subsidy, uh, all the snake farmers say, well, I'm not paying to feed these snakes anymore, so release them into the wild. I'm not sure that second phase actually happened. But uh, it's it's been recorded lots and lots of times where you have effectively unintended consequences. First of all, you obviously have to measure. But there is a huge danger that you measure too narrowly that you simply measure the narrow thing you're trying to achieve and you award yourself a big pat on the back for having achieved it. You also have to measure and therefore imagine in advance potential unintended consequences. And they're very, very common because human behaviour is very perverse. And so it's absolutely vital that you don't do that slightly dangerous self-selecting thing where you say, we'll define success in these very narrow terms, you know, number of dead cobras brought in, and we won't look more widely at what what, 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 what other behaviours our incentive or our nudge might be creating. And so there are quite a few cases where things have proved uh, in the long term, less effective than, than was initially believed. And so just because something works for the first three months isn't a guarantee that it's going to work in two years' time. So you've undoubtedly got to be pretty alert to that as well. Okay, final question for Ella. Ella, when it's a large public problem, health, sanitation, uh, poverty, disease, you have multiple stakeholders. You have the government, you have an NGO, you maybe have a corporate client. And you eventually have the user. Let's take the case of the Ecuadorian baby blankets that's there in your report. So who's the real client there? Is it the mother? Is it the baby? Is it the NGO? Is it the government? How do you define client in this case? So I think on a more business practical sense, we we say the client is the person who we're partnering to deliver the intervention. So I think when you think about the end user, that's really interesting. And, and that the behavioral target is something we define as the person or the thing that the society, the behaviour we're trying to change. So I think, as you say, there's multiple different different stakeholders and, and you have to be aware of everyone's different needs, both the user, the client, what are they going to get out of it, um, any kind of effects that happen to others, the environment. Um, and you have to take a really holistic view, really, and try and try and think about everyone. Ella Jenkins and Rory Sutherland of Ogilvy Consulting, thank you very much for joining us on Melt. Anytime. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. And that's a wrap on this episode. You can follow Melt on social media. The handle is ready to melt or simply log on to readytomelt.com. And if you'd like to follow me, I'm at Suvink on Twitter. Till next week, goodbye and thanks for watching. <laughs>